Kialga, ruler of time! Palkia, ruler of space! Release your powers now and create a new universe before me! It holds a grudge against humanity. Arceus remains intent on bringing us all to justice. It's possible that Arceus will destroy us entirely. A Pokémon destroying all people?! No way! It can't be! Have a look at this. Hey, Loxton. Toby! Are you ready for round three? <laughs> Generation 7. Sun and Moon and the Gen 4 remakes. They shall bring about an end to the Pokémon franchise before being reborn. Renewed! Rebooted! Preferably for an older audience. You said that this time we'll be talking about the Book of Revelation. The Bible's telling of the end times. And how Pokémon fit snugly into that? <laughs> yes. So get on Skype now, would you? Oh, all right, I'm here. What happened to your hair? Ah, first though, first, a very quick recap of everything we've covered so far. Basically, long story short, Pokémon since around Generation 3 or 4 has been based primarily on Greek mythology, as well as alchemy and astrology. On top of this, X and Y introduced Norse mythology, and a bit of Hinduism. And of course, Sun and Moon is bringing in Hawaiian and Polynesian mythology. There is also the language of flowers and numerology, and Pokémon Project Rainbow, the game that will have a lot to do with flowers, is in fact Sun and Moon. And earlier I've speculated on the goal of Team Skull, as well as what Mars Shadow will be, and more. And long story short, it all points to Sun and Moon, Generation 7 having one major theme. Death and Rebirth! Generation 7 will be some kind of big rebirthing moment before some major change happens and you get a, a reboot, I suppose. And a reboot makes perfect business sense. I mean, Pokemon's been on the decline since, well, forever. Only recently seeing a big boom with Pokemon Go. And Pokemon Go is a game that focuses entirely on Generation 1 Pokemon, and we know a large majority of the fanbase did leave after Generation 1 and 2. And I think a reboot might get them excited again, especially if it's a reboot of a Generation 1 thing, maybe with a more mature theme, just like the Pokemon Origins anime, for example. Also, while I'm still talking, I want to add something, because in part 2 we talked a lot about numberology, the spiritual power of numbers and the significance of numbers, and how every generation since Generation 3 seems to line up with the meaning of that number pretty perfectly, but you skip Generation 6. I did, didn't I? <laughs> I'm a ninny. So I looked into it myself, and 6 is the number of love, especially familial love, and Generation 6 introduced the very loving fairy type. Also, 6 is the number of balance, order, and harmony, and that is exactly what Zygarde is, the order Pokémon. And Zygarde is going to be playing a major role in both Generation 6 and 7. Also, 6 is the number of enlightenment, lighting our path in order to attain spiritual and mental balance. And I have a feeling light shining through the prism tower and sundial is going to play a big part in the upcoming games. Also, Generation 6 is the whole thing that started enlightening us into this whole alchemic thing that has apparently been in Pokémon since, like, Generation 4. Mm, yes. Anything else? Well, kind of. 6 is also the mark of the beast in the Bible, 666 to be specific. It's an unholy number, and another man's number, and men are sinners. It's unholy, but I don't see how that fits into the whole Pokémon universe. I mean, there has been some speculation about Giratina being the Pokémon version of the devil, but really he's just another part of the creation trio that created the universe. Trust me, by the end of today you will see how that's important. How that all comes together. Alright, but one more thing to do with numberology, and then you can get on, I promise. This is Pokémon's 20th anniversary, and it turns out that 20 also means death and rebirth. 
See, higher numbers in numberology combine the meanings of the numbers that form them, and in the case of 20, zero is death, oblivion, nothing, a void, and two is duality, a, a balance of both sides. In this case, you have your life which is one side, and then you die only to enter a second life, a second era. 20 is death and rebirth, the overall theme of Pokemon as of late. Excellent, excellent, and next year is the anime's 20th anniversary, so it has more time to do that as well. And also, there's the game's release date. The game comes out on November 18th. What? What does that have to do with anything? No, wait. It's numerology again. The way Japan writes their dates is year, month, day. Month, day is the same as in the US, by the way. And this means you write out the release date as 1118. And... 1,118 in numerology means, quote, you create your own reality. In Pokemon's case, this is literal, as you will discover at the very end of this call. But it also means, quote, you are nearing the end of a cycle in your life. Prepare for great changes in the future. <laughs> too much. Speaking of the anime, Ash lost. Yeah, I know. So... It doesn't disprove anything. It's like Jenga, but it certainly doesn't help. I'll talk to you more about that later. Okay, so back to this. You said you were going to talk about the Bible and symbolism this time around. Yes, yes. So the modern rise of alchemy, where it was greatly expanded upon more than any other era, came about in the late 1700s through the early 1900s in the Western world, which was dominated by various sects of Christianity. And thus, much of modern alchemy is heavily linked to it. And even before its modern re-rise, most alchemists in the Middle Ages were Gnostic Christians. I mean, you've already seen the name of the Judeo-Christian god in the first few videos at least twice within alchemic paintings. And remember, in the Pokémon world, Arceus is the equivalent. Right, right, so we'll be... Especially considering that the Arceus is a thing in alchemy. Whoa. <laughs> did you know that? Like most of the things you've been telling me, Luxin, I did not know that. But I can tell you for sure, properly, the origin of Arceus' name. It comes from Arc, as in High, as in Archangel, and Deus, meaning God, or uh, All High God. But this is a combination of two words, so if Arceus is actually a thing by itself in alchemy, then surely its origin has more relevance. Yeah, though that's not to say both origins can't work at the same time. A lot of Pokémon names have multiple origins. I did a whole video on it years ago. Anyway, in alchemy, the Arceus, which granted is spelled differently, though pronounced the same. Other Pokémon names do the same, just misspell words. Anyway, in alchemy, the Arceus is the densest and lowest aspect of the astral plane, which presides over the growth and continuation of all living beings. It is the glue that binds the spirit world and spiritual powers with the physical world and matter. Without the Arceus, souls would have no guidance upon the deaths of mortals. Without the Arceus, spiritual earth and life energy would slowly fade, and eventually life, reality as we know it, would be no more. The Arceus is also what allows gods to interact with the physical world, such as creating new things in it and such. At the Arceus, one can transmute matter into ether, spirit energy, and vice versa. The Arceus is where Azoth is at its most powerful. Anyone with the Philosopher's Stone will have ultimate power over the Azoth, and as such, the power of the Arceus, the power and wisdom of God, and can use that to merge the two separate worlds, either for everyone or just for themselves, and gain personal immortality. This just so happens to be the ultimate goal, the magnum opus of all alchemy, immortality. <laughs> the Arceus goes by a few names, Spirit of the World, Soul of the World, the Path of Saturn, the Earth Sphere, and so on. To some alchemists, this is where God manifests when interacting with our world. And to some other alchemists, the Arceus is God. And, as you pointed out before, Azoth is God's power, and Azoth allows for alchemy to take place, so alchemy is God's power. And thus, this leads us right into Arceus 
is Arceus. No doubt about it. Although I must say, I'm surprised alchemists don't seem to have a symbol for Arceus. I mean, they do seem to be a people that have a symbol for everything. <laughs> no, don't tell me you were just keeping it to yourself this whole time. And what for? More suspense and drama? You sicken me, Loxton. Here you go. What? This doesn't look like Arceus at all. Isn't this a Jewish thing? Yes, this is the Kabbalah, the centerpiece of Jewish mysticism. And so that I don't have to explain an entire religion, extremely long and complicated story short, it explains the attributes of God, the tree of life, creation, and its process. Basically, this is like the Pokedex entry to the Jewish God. Okay, but as you mentioned before, most alchemists were Gnostic Christians, not Jews. Right, though remember, the Christian God and the Jewish God were once one and the same in the Old Testament, at the time of creation, the most important time for Arceus. Right, but still, so this is the Jewish tree of life, and it's also explaining God, essentially, and I assume in a similar way to how alchemists explain the Arceus. Exactly, actually. And check this out. Of course. That's a snake. Zygarde, I presume. Yep, in Judaism there are two primary serpents, the serpent of evil which caused Eve to take from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and will also bring about the end. And there's also the serpent of ultimate good. Just like the two Zygards in the anime. But still, beyond some minor connection and interpretation, I don't see how the Kabbalah connects with Arceus. Well then, allow me to show you the symbol of the practical Kabbalah which was frequently engraved on Jewish amulets around the 15th century. Basically, this symbol has all of the same meaning as the regular Kabbalah, but is used by practitioners of white magic. Holy magic. Oh man, I'm convinced. Game Freak just took a few creative liberties, I guess, just by altering the word Arceus into Arceus, and the slight changes to Reshiram and Zekrom. It's not exact, but obviously inspired. <laughs> Especially since other names for both the Arceus and the Kabbalah is the Path of Saturn. And one more thing while on this topic, the Arceus gives us all life ether. It keeps us alive, binds our souls to our bodies, and in our bodies it is broken into two parts the chemical aura, and the life aura. As our stronger emotions burn, or our spirits rise, get put under pressure, and we fight back with determination, our chemical auras burn in a spiritual red flame. Our life auras, however, are constant, always there, though of course invisible to us. But to those who are trained to be able to see them, they appear as a blue light coming from our entire bodies. Exactly like in Pokemon. They've been hiding these references to alchemy underneath our noses the whole time, and it's only now in Generation 6 we're being enlightened. Generation 6, the generation of enlightenment. <laughs> Just like that Snorlax slowly getting up and now doing a unique Z move. They pointed that out in the same way they went through the history of Pokemon and said it all comes together in Sun and Moon. And plus, us all being enlightened right at the end is also why the Book of Revelation is called Revelation in the first place. In the end, more people will know the truth than ever, right before Armageddon. Oh, and did you notice that that Snorlax's Z-Stone is blue, just like the Generation 1 trainer who mentioned that his Snorlaxes wake up only about once a moon? Man, it's crazy. But anyway, it's time to jump straight into the Bible, right? Yeah, though before we get into it specifically, I should say that many famous and high-ranking alchemists and mystics have their own books about how the Bible spiritually fits into alchemy, clarifying a few things, and these things later became norms for the Bible's interpretation in the context of alchemy. For example, in that book, Secret Teachings of All Ages, which I mentioned in the first part, it heavily delved into biblical creation and destruction. In fact, most books about alchemy and mysticism were written with the Bible in mind. And I'm sure that you're aware that the Book of Revelation describes the end times, what Armageddon will be like, correct? Yeah. Well, I'll summarize Revelation chapter 4 and onwards for you, and note that this is going to be a somewhat loose connection to Pokemon. It's not perfect, at least not at first, but oh, does it start to line up? Chapter 12 speaks of a dragon that came down from the heavens, and in chapter 13 it states, The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. This sea beast was given authority by the dragon. But who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? Then I saw a second beast, coming out of the earth. It too had the same authority. 
As we know, in Pokémon, Groudon and Kyogre are the legendary Pokémon, or the beasts, of the land and sea. And the dragon, Rayquaza, has authority over them, but these two are also given authority by Rayquaza. These two can do whatever, but Rayquaza can come down whenever and give the final say. Also, these three are the three Pokémon created by Arceus to create the physical Pokémon world, the land, sea, and air. But they also have the power to end it. Hence, Alpha Sapphire, the beginning, just as all life began in the ocean, and Omega Ruby, the end. As when we die, we return to the Earth. In Revelation 22.13, God is speaking and states, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Death and rebirth again. It continues, Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the Tree of Life. The Tree of Life? So this is referring to alchemy? Not quite. Remember last time we mentioned that alchemy is the artificial way to gain the power of Azoth, the Tree of Life, infinity energy, life energy, whatever you want to call it, and with this power you gain perfection and immortality. Well, according to the Bible, you can do the same just by listening to God's word, washing your robes, as it were. Here, God lets those he spared in Armageddon come into his holy city, where the Tree of Life resides, for them to become perfect and immortal. That would explain why the Bible says not to get involved with spiritualism and the occult, such as alchemy, finding a way to immortality without God. Exactly! The mystic side of alchemy is quite literally playing God. And God doesn't like that, as the Bible says, he is a jealous God. And now, let's get more into the Bible's foretelling of Armageddon. There are seven angels who deal destruction to the earth, one by one, and after the seventh one is finished, they exclaim that it is done. Just like the quote found in many books about alchemy, it's finished when seven becomes one. And when you were explaining numerology last time, seven represents perfection, the finished product, the end. And of course, if you go past that, you get eight, which represents rebirth and renewal and the beginning of another cycle. But anyway, generation seven, the end, yeah? Sun and Moon are the first generation seven games. And you know that more than likely the Gen 4 remakes are coming next, and that would mean the Gen 4 remakes would be part of the seventh gen, just as the Gen 3 remakes are now part of the sixth gen, and so on and so forth. It would make a ton of sense for the creator of the Pokémon universe, the god of the Pokémon world, who was revealed in these Gen 4 games, to also be the one to reset everything. The Alpha and the Omega. Just imagine what sort of power a Primal or Mega Arceus is capable of, or even a Mega Primal Arceus, let alone Dialga, Palkia, and Giratina being Primals. The power levels they used when creating the universe? Surely they could reset it. Easily. In fact, that would go along perfectly with the Biblical Armageddon. Firstly, the whole point of Armageddon is God bringing judgment to humans. And Arceus's main move is the move, Judgment. In fact, this move appears to cause fiery hail, meteors, to rain from the heavens, which Revelation says is one of the main things that will happen during Armageddon. In the end... Earth and Heaven get completely annihilated before being recreated, as in Revelation 21.1, it states that after Armageddon, there is a new Heaven and a new Earth. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Universal death and rebirth at the hands of Arceus, but what about the whole only one game thing you brought up last time? Zygarde's Crystal seemed to be hinting at one solid white game, and Platinum is a silverish white, but why would they go from dual games to one? Well, the Nintendo NX is Nintendo's next system, and basically every patent and rumor surrounding it seems to point at it being a handheld console hybrid. Oh, meaning it's the next handheld system, so the next Pokemon game would be on it. Exactly, and there's never been dual releases of console Pokemon games, it's always just one. So, in this case, the Gen 4 remakes may wind up being just a single remake. A remake of Platinum, rather than Diamond and Pearl. And also, Platinum would work out beautifully as a continuation of the story of Sun and Moon, because Platinum's symbol is the same symbol as the Sun symbol and the Moon symbol combined. 
I can picture it now. The Gen 4 remake, Neo Platinum, or the Platinum Eclipse. This time, this time with Arceus on the cover. Why would Platinum's cover switch from Giratina to Arceus? The Pokemon on the covers of the games are almost always the most important Pokemon to the story of the game. While Arceus is the most important Pokemon of all, it didn't play a huge part in the story of Platinum. But in Neo Platinum, it very well could. Also, Junichi Masuda, the director of Pokemon, the apparent madman that he is, has been quoted as saying that he doesn't like the next Pokemon games being predictable. Which is why rather than going to Pokemon Grey after Black and White, a third improved version of the previous two that they have done with almost every other version, they did sequels. This is also why they didn't make a Pokemon Z. So perhaps to switch up the predictability of Gen 4 remakes, they changed the plot big time. Or at the very least, the Pokemon on the cover. I can see that. Although, they've been using dual games since the beginning. Do you really think that'll change? Dual games on console is tricky. But the NX also being a handheld, hmm, I could see dual games being possible. Which is why there is an alternate interpretation of the Zygarde colors. They may not mean the games, but rather the legendaries on these games. Arceus in the middle for the singular Gen 4 remake, or side note, it could also wind up being a whole new game, Eclipse, it's possible. Anyway, then Solgaleo and Lunala, Groudon on Kyogre, Xerneas, and Yveddle. It could be a hierarchy of legendaries, or perhaps a reference to the seven days of creation in the Bible. First, God, or Arceus, created the universe along with his son and his angels, just as Arceus first created Dialga, Palkia, and Giratina, who then all created the universe. But wait, so then all of those Pokémon would be represented as just the white spot in the middle of Zygarde? Yeah, Zygarde is the guardian of the Earth, so its colors may not care about time and space, only Earth and the life upon it, as you will now see. So back to the Bible. God created light and then separated light and dark, and called them night and day. Night and day, so the sun and moon. Yes and no. The sun and moon themselves were created on the fourth day, which is why I said it doesn't fit perfectly. But remember, Solgaleo and Lunala are not the sun and moon directly. They are the emissaries, the ambassadors, representatives. They come from the sun and moon, but aren't them directly. So light, then! <laughs> yep, and remember what I said before? God's word interacts with us through solar fire and lunar water. So they would need to be set up pretty early on in order to form the rest of the Earth. Continuing, and then God created the sea, and then the land, and finally, life. And eventually, thanks to Eve, death. You know, I do find it interesting that originally, Pokemon games, when revealing their legendaries, they were all about creation. So, for example, in Generation 3, you had the creation of the Earth, the land, the sea, the sky. Uh, and, of course, in Generation 4, you have the creation of the universe as a whole. And then, in Generation 5, you had truth and ideals, a battle of willpower and differing views, begging the question of you to look at something from a different perspective. And since then, now we've had a Pokemon of death and games revolving around death and a mass loss of life. And the Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, the Generation 3 remakes, they've suddenly gone from just expanding the land and the sea to trying to destroy and reset the world. And we know that the evil teams aren't done with wanting to end or reset the Pokemon world just yet, and I'm sure it will be the same in Sun and Moon. It'll all be about the end of the Pokemon world, or at the very least, the remakes of the Gen 4 games will have an even greater emphasis on the destruction of the universe. Or, like you said, like in the Bible, it's total destruction and recreation. Ah, uh, the biblical end times. Let's go back to that city that the Tree of Life was in real quick. I should mention that this godly city has some... interesting architecture. Firstly, it doesn't get any sunlight or moonlight because God's glory replaces the sun and moon. Let me rephrase that again. God's glory is taking the role of both the sun and the moon. Take the sun and moon symbols and combine them, we get platinum which is a bright white color, Arceus. And guess what the walls around the city are made of? Too late, they are encrusted with diamonds and pearls. What? No, because- I know, I know, I gotta specify something here. The gates around the city are encrusted with pearls and the gates themselves are giant pearls. The jewels around the city are various stones listed here. You'll notice none of them actually quote diamonds, but back when the Bible was written, there was no word for diamond, 
Rather, there was the Latin and Greek word adamant, which referred to all hard gemstones. Diamonds were not a specified stone at the time. Rather, diamonds were put into categories of these other gemstones, depending on what type of diamond and its composition was and all kinds of things. Essentially, diamonds were like a blank slate, the Eevee of gemstones. It fits into almost all other categories, but centuries later, this word adamant would later come to be used for the word specifically for diamonds, rather than all hard gemstones. In other words, you could translate the Bible's original text as all of these stones were diamonds, because in this case, diamond refers to all hard gemstones. And plus, oh man, the orb that the Apple holds is called the adamant orb, as if to hint the idea all along. Ooh. So, so this city that houses the Tree of Life, or Azoth, has diamonds, pearls, and platinum. The Gen 4 games. So the Gen 4 remakes will likely follow the biblical end times then. Yes, the biblical end times. And there are a number of things that the Bible says are warning signs that the end is near. One that is commonly pointed to is the rise of earthquakes, and the power of earthquakes growing ever stronger. And surely, Groudon has that kind of power, but Groudon has no business being in Sun or Moon or a Gen 4 remake, but Zygarde does. Zygarde, the ground dragon Pokemon, it watches over the earth from underground. And you know how in X and Y the legendaries have some roots in Norse mythology? The Tree of Life and all? Well, guess what the serpentine dragon at the bottom is capable of causing in its mythos? Earthquakes. Yep, and another biblical point made about the end times is that those destroying the earth would be destroyed. Zygarde is the Earth's guardian, the guardian of the environment. It brings order to those harming the environment, trying to bring ruin to the Earth. If the threat was bring enough, then surely Zygarde could easily deal with it and destroy the threat with earthquakes. We humans are chaotic and difficult to manage. Meaning, if a Pokemon were to end humanity, that Pokemon would be restoring order to the Earth. And Zygarde is, after all, the order Pokemon. You could even say that ending the Earth as a whole would bring further order to the universe. And plus, if Zygarde even has all that power, if it were to fall into the wrong hands, it could easily destroy the Earth. If Zygarde were to fall under Cyrus or Lysander level mind control, it could bring the end. Bring Z. And plus, this would mean Zygarde doesn't directly trigger the Poke Apocalypse but indirectly triggers it. Maybe Zygarde is the Pokemon Devil. Zygarde is? But Giratina? Giratina being the Pokemon Devil is fan speculation. Though, all of this is too. But the reason Giratina is seen as the Pokemon Devil is because it has those six neck things. Six spikes on its wings, six legs, you know, 666. And because it was cast down and banished by Arceus, just as God did with Satan. And Giratina still may be the Pokemon Satan, as there are a good number of Bible interpretations that state that Satan, the Devil, Lucifer, etc. are actually all separate beings. It's a similar idea to the Holy Trinity, multiple beings in one. So both could be Satan in some combination. Anyway, Jesus has referred to Satan as the ruler of this world, and even the god of this world, referring to the Earth. And while Satan or Zygarde have this power over the Earth, God or Arceus does have ultimate authority over everything. So back to Revelation. One of the very last things done after the seventh bowl is poured, we get an interesting bit of scripture. And again, the, the transition into Pokemon is somewhat loose. Revelation 11.18 Your wrath has come. The time has come to judge the dead and to destroy those who destroy the Earth. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman, clothed in the sun, with the moon under her feet. Then another sign appeared in heaven, a huge red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven royal crowns on its head. His tail swept a third of the stars from the sky, tossing them to the earth. This dragon is later specified to be Satan the Devil. But if Satan takes on the form of the seven-headed red dragon during the Armageddon, then that doesn't exactly fit. Right. Let's get to that. Remember, Game Freak is allowed to use all of the creative liberties they want. Just like how in part 2 I showed you how undoubtedly Reshiram and Zekrom are based on the two contraries in alchemy. Yet, Game Freak still took creative liberties and did not design them to look 100% like what they are based on. Yes, but red to green is a big difference. They are in fact completely opposite colors. Though, when the world-loving Zygards get taken over and begin the process of resetting the world in the anime, 
they glow red. Also, rather than seven heads, it has six. One main one, and these five others. Because Pokemon already has enough history and controversy around it being the game of the devil corrupting our youth. Could you imagine if they had a literal Satan the Dragon Pokemon? <laughs> or at least one that was so obvious. So instead, just like Giratina, they put a lot of sixes on it. Six heads, six little armpits, plus it's covered in hexagons, the six-sided shape, and each tentacle wing thing is also a whole new head. And the anime recently showed that its tail is also a head. Meaning Perfect Zygarde does indeed have seven heads. I can see that interpretation. And you can blame Satan for ending the world even. Why does God redo it? Because humans are full of sin. Why is that? Because of Satan. Satan inadvertently brings about Armageddon, just as Zygarde could inadvertently bring about the end of the Pokemon world by being taken over. And plus, just as there are two Zygards, there are two dominant serpentine dragons in Norse mythology. One at the bottom of the Tree of Life, and one swimming around Asgard as it bites its tail. Nidhogg and Jormungand. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right. Jormungand preserves the balance and order of Asgard, but when it eventually lets go of its tail, it triggers Ragnarok. The end of Asgard, Norse Armageddon. But not entirely the end of everything, rather it will permanently change it, and end the way things were, put it into a new era after destroying everything. A new state of being. A reboot. Arceus is the Alpha Pokemon, Zygarde is the Z. Alpha and A are the same symbol in both the Latin and Greek alphabets. So here we have our creator and destroyer. I have a feeling that Sun and Moon, along with the inevitable Gen 4 remakes, will be the biggest Pokemon games yet. Especially since now they have a potentially much larger audience. How so? Reasons I explain in this video. Rebooting makes 100% business sense. They will make so much money off of it. Oh, okay. So, rebooting. Bringing about the end of this Pokemon era and ending it in this way is perfect. Sun and Moon. Combine them, you get an Eclipse. So that, plus Earthquakes, and you get Revelation 612. Near the end of Armageddon. Quote, I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as a sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. But that's describing both the solar and lunar eclipse. Those can't happen at the same time. And animals catch fire electricity out of their cheeks. And surely when dealing with a god figure, anything is possible. In fact, if you were to magically somehow have a solar and lunar eclipse at the same time, then you would have the Earth, Sun, and Moon all lined up with the Earth in the middle. And what happens when planets align, according to alchemy? The elements that the aligned planets represent become strengthened. So with the Sun and Moon aligned like this, it's gold and silver, and that becomes platinum, right where the Earth is. And since Platinum now represents Arceus, which also fits perfectly because Platinum is the most holy metal, and since back in 2.5 I explained that the Eclipse is a time where the spirit world and physical world are at its nearest, and the border between the two is the Arceus, what better time to reset the universe than while space is aligned that makes Arceus at maximum power? Oh. Now then, next point, remember in the Hoopa movie we see Arceus priests literally using alchemy, and we see Arceus combining five elements to create the Jew of Life, and here it uses a transmutation circle to create new matter and life from nothing but energy. Alchemy, the combination of science and mysticism. Just recently, scientists finally managed to create matter from energy, proving that it is possible after centuries of thinking it was impossible. So the Big Bang, God-induced or otherwise, was a huge burst of energy that created matter. In alchemy, creating something with energy alone is considered to be a godly power. Normally, you need an equivalent exchange of matter. But the power to transmute without this exchange... This power is what mastering the Azoth would grant. Meaning, yes, someone who masters the Azoth has many of the powers of God, and could recreate the universe themselves. Just as the Bible says God will do. 
And speaking of the Christian god, beyond just Arceus being the Pokemon world equivalent, there is another reference to him. In Pokemon Black and White, the evil team is named Team Plasma. And firstly, that's brilliant, because the legendaries are a fire dragon type and an electric dragon type and fire and lightning are both plasma when powerful enough. Google it, it's genius. Anyway. They are based on medieval knights. They dress up as knights, their base is a castle, they refer to their leader as lord, they have emblems shaped like shields, and their emblem is this. P.S. for plasma. What of it? Well, from around the year 300 onwards, the Greeks and Romans would put an emblem on their shields of some of their more prized Christian knights. It was an emblem to represent the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection all in one symbol death and rebirth. So a cross. P.S. looks nothing like a cross. Actually, they made a new emblem to symbolize this. It was called the chi Ro, and it looks like this. Oh, if you just swapped out the X for an S, it would be a perfect fit. And the X and this spiked out S aren't actually too different visually. And wait, no. Is that an alpha and omega symbol on either side of it? <laughs> yep, yep. And do you want to know why this was designed the way it was? Well, first, it's the first two letters of the Greek word for Christ. But also, the X symbolizes Plato's visible god, which is where the Milky Way intersects with the zodiacal light. See? It's an X. The chi Rho also represents the cross, of course, but also the celestial equator, the divide of the two great circles, where the universe is split in half. Which is what N, the puppet leader of Team Plasma, wanted to do. Split the world to separate humans and Pokemon. And you could say that the border between the two is the same thing as the Arceus. But anyway, lastly, the whole thing represents the death and resurrection of Jesus. Death and rebirth. And it also represents the solar ecliptic path. The eclipse, which in alchemy and astrology symbolize death and rebirth. And that makes sense why they would change it to a Z like S instead of an X, because keeping it the same as the Shi Ro would essentially make it a cross in the game, and Nintendo doesn't blatantly want religious references in their games. Right, right. The Shi Ro is still used by the Roman Catholic Church today, even. So Game Freak just put the X's elsewhere, like on the grunts' heads, or more obviously, right behind the emblem on the staff of Getsis the true leader of Team Plasma. If that's not obvious, I don't know what is, especially considering the vast amount of conspiracy theories around the Catholic Church secretly using alchemy themselves and just not wanting others to do it. Plus, look at how Getsis summons Reshiram from a stone and totally not magical transmutation circle. This stone, by the way, Reshiram essentially transmuted itself into and now Getsis is transmuting it back into Reshiram, forcefully. Also, Getsis's name is derived from G-Sis. Jesus. G-Sis, a set of notes that is referred to as the devil in music. So I did some digging and it turns out that music did play a huge part in medieval alchemy and mysticism, and playing such music was prohibited as it invoked the devil. Okay, okay, but this is taking a bit too long, so don't go into how music fits into this, please. Instead, uh, oh, here's a question. In Black and White 2, they go from being these Catholic knights to having this whole pirate-like power structure. What's all that about? It goes along with history perfectly, actually. Later on into the usage of the Chi Ro, it was used as a symbol of the Knights Templar. These Knights of Jesus, as they were so called, were of course supporters of Rome and the Pope. But as time went on, the Pope began losing power, and around the 12th century, the Templars began disbanding. And since many of these had fleets of ships, and were savvy businessmen and prosperous sea merchants, they became pirates, but not just any pirates, but the first pirate to use the skull and crossbones. And why is that? Because when the first Templars were executed for pirate-related crimes, their bodies would be burned, but their skull and femurs remain, and they would put them in the symbol of the Chi Ro. So just like Team Plasma, this symbol originated with knights that became pirates. <sighs> Oh, here's a question. Why would the Roman Catholics be depicted as bad guys? Because to alchemists, they were the bad guys. Christianity split into Catholicism and Gnostic Christian, and the vastly larger Catholics, of course, had many rules being enforced by the governments. Things like, you have to be a Roman Catholic, for instance. And alchemists felt that their rules were too strict, so they left and formed the Gnostic Christian branch. But of course, because Catholics banned any sort of mysticism, 
alchemy was strictly prohibited, because alchemy is, after all, an attempt at playing God. And they would severely punish those caught in the act of alchemy, so of course, the alchemists saw the Catholic Church as the enemy. In fact, this is also why the Dark Ages happened. It was hard for the church to figure out whether someone was an alchemist or a legitimate scientist. So from the church's perspective, they just grouped them all together, said they were one and the same, punished both. Hence, the centuries of scientific advancement lost. And just as Team Plasma wanted to take away everyone's Pokémon to have power over them, so too did the Catholic Church take away the potential alchemic power from the people, and had that power over them. Just as Team Plasma has the Seven Sages, a group of intelligent people from all over the world, the Catholic Church has Cardinals, a group of intelligent and highly faithful people from all over the world. And both are all after the same goal. A new world order. Though in the case of the Catholic Church, that's just what many conspiracies state. The Illuminati stuff. Like, they want to make the Philosopher's Stone too. You know, make type null. Make type null? Oh yeah, Type Null, the Chimera, the Artificial God Pokémon, the Philosopher's Stone Pokémon. Yeah, I should have mentioned that sooner. Yeah, you should have. Please explain. So, Type Null's description confirms that it is a Chimera, stating that it is man-made from people merging other Pokémon. Plus, just look at it. But the funny thing is, we already know which Pokémon they merged. The starters! Remember, the starters each represent one of the ingredients needed to make a Philosopher's Stone. Salt, Sulfur, and Mercury. And there was that quote about them when they were revealed, stating, Unlike in previous games, the starters this time will play an important role in the story. And on Type Null, we have green bird-like legs, a blue aquatic tail, and a cat-like head. Obviously the starters, or one of their evolutions. But there are only three side ingredients. The main ingredient is lead. Rock Rough, which was described as being just as important to the story as the starters. And Type Null's base is canine-like. And plus, Type Null's description mentions that it was made for a certain mission, and to have a power that rivals that of Pokémon spoken of in mythology. And considering this symbol on its mask is extremely close to the symbol of Arceus, and it has this long head thing, <laughs> I'm sure you understand. Oh, I do! The Philosopher's Stone grants power over Azoth, like the power of God. So in Pokemon, they're making their own God the way you would make a Philosopher's Stone, but clearly it failed. I imagine making God isn't the easiest thing to do. Plus the name, Type Null. Null meaning nothing. There are plenty of religions and branches of Christianity and Hinduism and even Shintoism that teach that God is in the nothingness. Nothingness is God. Somebody tried creating God? But who? Team Skull? The Aether Foundation? I know you've mentioned it before, but what is Aether really? Oh easy, it's the fifth element in alchemy. You have Earth, Air, Water, Fire, and Aether. Spirit. Soul. Heaven. Etc. We'll talk more about them later. And whomever tried making Type Null, <coughs> totally Team Aether, <clears throat> put this mask on it to restrain and bind its power. Control its power level. Just as Cyrus did to Dialga and Palkia with those very same symbols. This is still so crazy. So then, how much is left? <laughs> All that is left is one minor point and one major point. Small point first, then. So you know how Professor Oak's cousin is in Sun and Moon? And his name is Samson Oak, and in the Bible, Samson had long hair as his defining feature? And he was known for his feats of strength. The first of which was slaying a lion. And the last of which was destroying a pagan temple. And as far as the old Catholic Church was concerned, alchemy was paganism. Also, the name Samson means man of the sun. Come to think of it, what was the original Oak's name again? Uh, Samuel? Yes, and Samuel in the Bible was known for appointing the first two kings of Israel, both of whom were chosen by God. And now here's the major point. Think back to when I called you that very first time. Did I bring up anything that we haven't talked about yet? It all comes it all together. Comes together. Every, every, every Pokemon game, game, the anime, the movie, the, movie, the, card, the card game, game the, card the card game, the Pokemon trading card game. So each generation of Pokemon, there is a new series of cards, and within them are different sets, different expansions. Right now we have the Break series, containing multiple expansions, and each expansion and set have mini plots to them. 
They don't really affect the gameplay at all, but do affect some of the artwork on the cards. Right now, the point of the break line is that Pokémon that don't Mega Evolve are finding ways to push past the boundaries of their normal evolution. Push ever nearer to perfection, and of course, when they do this, they turn gold, one of the perfect metals. In a way, they are becoming enlightened to a new, higher state of being. A whole new evolution, breaking past their barriers. And funnily enough, the current plot is... <sighs> Let me just read it to you. An amazing discovery! Pokémon Break Evolution opens a new path to power that builds on a Pokémon's existing strengths and creates all new battling options. These new Pokémon Break come from twin worlds. One of technology, one of nature. And all the wonders of Break Evolution. Hmm? Next expansion. A rift torn between worlds. The hour grows desperate, and two worlds stand at the brink. The Pokémon trading card game XY Breakpoint expansion reveals the growing rift between the twin worlds. As the rift tears through the skies, more Pokémon are drawn into the struggle. Can they mend the rift and save both worlds from collision chaos? Do you see where this is going? <laughs> Next, reality shifts and is remade. Mega Alakazam EX sees the future and shapes it to unify two worlds. The legendary Pokémon Zygarde arrives in many different forms to bring order. Fates are sealed, and two Pokémon worlds join together in the Pokémon trading card game XY Fates Collide expansion. Mm -hmm. And finally, the final set in the XY series, Evolutions. The Pokémon legacy evolves, all trainers and Pokémon grow and evolve, and this expansion restores the very first Pokémon trading cards to glory. The classic, hard-battling Pokémon and old-school trainers are reinvented for a new generation. Ask Professor Oak to get you started and reach new heights with the Pokémon trading card game XY Evolutions expansion. So in the trading card game universe, there were two alternate worlds that came together and reality was remade, and following that, it wrapped around and is returning again to the very first generation of Pokémon. Ha <laughs> ha, but that means the X and Y series of cards is the one to have the reboot, but before Sun and Moon? So are Sun and Moon the reboots then? Could be. Very well could be. They certainly are different enough. And plus, if Sun and Moon just so happen to introduce 128 new Pokémon, which is very doable, then guess what Gen 8, which is the reboot as we've established, would need to total 1,000. 151. A whole new Gen 1! And currently, there are many reputable sources claiming that Nintendo and Game Freak are currently working on a singular remake of the Gen 1 Pokémon games on the Nintendo NX. Surely, a handheld console hybrid is capable of vastly changing Pokémon, and a redo of Gen 1 will get a lot of those who left Pokémon interested again. Hmm. It all comes together into one massive remake. A wholly redesigned Kanto with newer Pokémon turned into unique Kanto form Pokémon. Open world perhaps, but who knows. And just like the card game story, the video games also refer to dual worlds, such as the Delta episode of Oraz. They use their advanced technology to detect another world, another dimension, one without Mega Evolution. Oh right, the Pokemon Multiverse has always been canon, like when trading or battling or playing any kind of Pokemon multiplayer with different game versions, it's always explained as something mysterious happening or even time travel with some sort of space time hole and stuff. And heck, even in black and white, you've got like the black city and the white forest both in the exact same place, but in one universe it's a forest and in the other it's a metropolis. Technology versus nature, just like in the card games. And just like Mega Evolution versus Primal Reversion Break and the spiritual bond between Ash and Greninja, one is artificial and one is natural. Alright, so tell me now, what does this all lead to? How will the games actually go about everything? Please, conclude. One more side thing that is a bit of a stretch, but you know, I feel like it's worth mentioning. So remember that book from the third movie that we mentioned in part two, the one that is described as an artist's rendition of what never-before-seen legendary Pokémon look like? 
It also predicts the reset. What? So in the movie, the book is shown to also be a foreteller of the future, as events in the movie have been in the book all along. And now, this is a bit of a stretch, but hear me out. The first page we are shown is this one, with a bunch of unknown taking the shape of an atom. And of course, we know that Arceus used the power of the unknown to create the universe. And now, who is this old robed man here? Why are there Greek columns here? And does this group of unknowns say anything? I and a group of others spent like three hours on this, and no, for the most part, these unknown are just broken up chunks of the alphabet. But interestingly, the only missing letter is G. And there are repeats of other letters, so there's no reason for there not to be a G. But maybe, maybe there's no G because this old robed man is blocking it, perhaps. Maybe this old robed man with all of these Greek columns creating an atom is the big G. God. But the Pokemon God is Arceus. But most people, even within the Pokemon universe, don't know that. Arceus is the most mythical Pokemon of all mythical Pokemon, and since this book is in-universe, an artist's rendition of what some never-before-seen Pokemon may look like, the artist may have come to the conclusion that, hey, humans are smart, God is probably a human of sorts. Also, side note, G is the seventh letter of the alphabet, and is in the middle of the Freemason symbol, which are speculated to also be a group of modern-day alchemists and mystics. And Team Galactic's logo is also G. <laughs> Getting into some real conspiracy theory stuff now. Okay, but what's next? The next page shows us Entei, so skip ahead from the creation of the universe to Gen 2. Next, we are shown Crystal Towers. Pokemon Crystal came out almost a year after this movie did. And the next page has a fairy. Skip ahead to Generation 6, and we now have fairy-type Pokemon. Next page, a sun legendary over a tropical island with hibiscus flowers. Obviously, this is sun and moon. And then... The creation with the unknown again! And the cycle continues, with Entei once again. That is a bit of a stretch, though. A bit, yeah. Plus, I get the feeling it wasn't until Gen 3 or 4 that they even started planning all of this. Gen 1 was its own thing, an experimental game. They had no idea it would take off. Gen 2 was just the sequel. But by the time the third rolled around, they actually realized that they had a very long-term franchise on their fans, so they could begin multi-generational storytelling like this. Good point. I'm sure that's exactly the case. Now then, please, conclude. I will begin my conclusion with a question. Whatever happened to Cyrus? The leader of Generation 4's Team Galactic who wanted to reset the universe. Do you know what? I don't know. In fact, no one knows. In the games, and in the anime, and the manga, he just left into an alternate space-time. In the anime, he personally possessed the Algor and Palkia and had them create an entirely new universe for him, and with his glove built to use the original power of Arceus, he entered his new universe and that was the last we ever saw of him. And thanks to Oraz, we know for a fact that the multiverse is canon in Pokemon. Specifically, one universe with mega evolution and more advanced technology, and one without it and less advanced technology. Like the card game! The two worlds are merging, it's literally all coming together. Perhaps in Sun and Moon, the portal that the Eclipse causes will open a portal between these universes, and they merge like an Eclipse. And perhaps this will all be directed by a new, almost godlike Cyrus, who also opened a portal from his universe to the universe in Sun and Moon. Playing God. But just playing is not enough for him. With the power of Mega Evolution and Primal Evolution that exists in these universes, he could cause Arceus to do everything for him. He could take over Arceus, Primal Evolve it, and bring together not just two already conjoining universes, but the multiverse. All Cyrus wanted to do was make a void for himself, for everyone, to destroy the universe and recreate an empty one. So either in Sun and Moon or the Gen 4 remake, the bad guys will win. But why would they let the bad guy win? Oh, of course the bad guy isn't going to win, at least not entirely. Here is a small example of what I think is possible, though you might as well consider this some educated fanfiction. 
At some point, Team Skull will take over the observatory. Using that, they will know exactly when the planets will align, as well as the next eclipse. Solgaleo, or Lunala, depending on your version, will also be used by Team Skull, or the Aether Foundation. We'll get to that. They will be used to perfect the alignment, or to hold the sun or moon in place to elongate the eclipse. Doing so will allow the world of the dead or the spirit world to merge with the Pokemon world, or this will open a portal in space-time to the other, already confirmed, other universe. The ones we played in before X and Y. The universe without Mega Evolution. Perhaps they will merge, just as they do in the card game. Of course, though, this upsets everything. So Zygarde comes in and learns that the only way to maintain order in this world is to either destroy the humans causing this, or end the world, or more likely, end the other world, the alien parallel dimension. But Zygarde could be taken over. And this could be done by the Aether Foundation wanting to create a paradise, done by Guzma wanting immortality, or by Cyrus wanting to just end everything. And Cyrus could find his way into this new Mega Evolution universe, this universe with alchemic magic, Mega Evolutions and Primal Evolutions. With these new powers, he surely could neutralize the multiverse. Meanwhile, directed by some higher force, the Aether Foundation creates Type Null in an attempt to create Arceus for reasons I'll explain later. They too want to merge universes, though for the benefit of everyone, at least from their perspective. So more things happen wherein Arceus is summoned, or it came here by itself to either further protect the world as it has in the past, or continue the process of Poke Armageddon that Zygarde started. Humans have sinned far too much and will be judged. However, Guzma and or Cyrus and or the Aether Foundation, someone gains control of Arceus. All the while, all of the greatest Pokemon trainers from the franchise, Red, Blue, Cynthia, other champions, previous playable characters, and you, the player, go to stop whomever is controlling Arceus. Many fights with powerful Pokemon are had on the way, but in the process, Arceus has already begun the universal bonding, bringing the entire universe together to reset it. You work your way up and wind up fighting Arceus itself acting as a totem Pokémon as it creates other legendary Pokémon to fight alongside it, and the battle continues. Eventually, you beat Arceus, but by beating it, you only beat the possession out of it. And now it attacks Cyrus, and or Guzma, and or the Aether Foundation, all the bad people, into oblivion. The day is saved, but during your battle, too much time has passed. It is too late. The universe is no more, it is only you, the player, and Arceus. Arceus apologizes, and perhaps through unknown lettering, explains that it must recreate the universe. But now, since you saved it, it will recreate the universe how you see fit. Of course, it will be scripted. A universe of peace and love for Pokémon. A universe where no one can any longer take advantage of Pokémon and use them for evil. Or at the very least, not as easily. And Arceus makes it so. A new universe, a new game. The reboot of Pokemon is shortly after on the Nintendo NX, a console level main Pokemon game set in another brand new universe. It gives Game Freak a chance to fix some things, rework some things, retcon a few things, and to just bring it all in for one epic Pokemon adventure. Cyrus and or a Gen 4 remake may not even be involved. It could entirely just be Guzmo or the Aether Foundation trying to merge the worlds, either just these two universes or the spirit world with the world of the living to gain immortality. All kinds of things. There are many, many possibilities. And that is just one of them. Will Sun and Moon be the final game? Will Neo Platinum be? Will there be a whole different third one that I didn't think of? Only time will tell. I know it sounds like a bit of an overly hopeful fan fiction, but it's just an example. I get it though, so many of the bad guys want to reset the universe. One of them actually manages to, but at the very end you win and the universe is recreated peacefully in a much better way. It's beautiful. The character, the player character, you, will literally create your own reality, just as the number 1118 symbolizes.
But I have to wonder, since we brought up Arceus again, that symbol around him, the part of Saturn, or the practical Kabbalah, when around type Null, it holds back, suppresses it, it controls it, and even around the Algon Palkia, it does the same. But then, what is it doing around Arceus? Something has been in control, and whatever it is, it must be an ultra-powerful beast, don't you think? <laughs> Hello everyone, thanks for listening to me. It is so hot in here. But seriously, thank you, I really appreciate it. And thank you especially to Andy Frogman, the priest of gamers, for helping me explain the various religious interpretations. Check out his website in the link in the description as a means of saying thanks. And same goes for Birdkeeper Toby also. He's been a great test subject. And also, an especially huge thank you to all of you who stuck around to watch me stress my hair white. This project has taken over 300 hours of research and writing, 250 hours of editing, and also re-watching a lot of Pokemon episodes and movies and Let's Plays and everything. And I'm not even done yet! But I do plan on finishing before Sun and Moon comes out. But then also making another part afterwards, going through everything that I got wrong and everything that I got right. Though a lot of what I bring up may be in the Gen 4 remakes and not Sun and Moon. But eh. And because this is such a crazy huge project, for once I'm actually really going to push my Patreon here. If you can, and I don't want to make anybody do it, but if you can and are very willing, it is highly appreciated. Any amount of Patreon donation would be extremely helpful. Honestly, the best thing you could ever do for any YouTuber is give them a dollar. So please consider it as well as consider sharing this video, leaving a like, and commenting, Whoa, this Pokemon stuff is crazy! into the comment section. All that stuff actually does help videos get around more. And again, one more plug, I have a link in the description to a playlist that contains all of my videos on this topic of Pokemon and alchemy, and mysticism, and all this fun stuff. And it's still not finished, I have a few small five minute videos still planned to fill in some gaps because my word, the number of details I left out just for time constraints. So tell me down below what you think about all this, and be smart, don't be stupid. That should be this channel's new catchphrase. Finally. Ugh. My voice is dead. I knew you were foreshadowing something!